This week on The Greatest Stories Never Told, we have someone who's a personal mentor to me in storytelling, David Nihill. David has taught some of the top TED speakers how to refine their talks. He teaches people communication at Oxford University, Stanford, and he's funny as hell. I've learned so much from him, and I am beyond excited to share his knowledge with you. It's coming up right now. David Nihill. Hello there. David Anwar Nihill. Exactly. That's my new We're name. We're going to have Thank a lot of inside much. jokes on this episode. And if people at home are going to laugh a lot. Hopefully. All right. You can edit that in after. So you're Irish. Yes. That's basically your bio. That should be my bio. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, enough. Yeah. No matter what you tell Americans, they're like, yeah, that's all great. All I heard was you have a weird accent. Where are you from? And mm. then somehow your name Dave gets Irish added to it as if you're the only Irish person that they might have met. And you'll now become one of the five Irish Daves that they know in America somehow. And that's kind of usually it. That's probably how I ended up with the worst stage name ever, Irish Dave. Yeah, that's pretty much how it happened. That's because uh, people didn't know what else to refer to you by? Yeah, you'd be surprised. They just don't understand a lot you're saying pretty early on. It's funny uh, when that translates to the world of speaking because they're like, what are you going to open with? It must be impactful or something. And you're like, no one's going to understand what well, I'm saying. Well, you have to open with the elephant in the room. Yeah. But you are. And address your accent. And I am Irish. Yeah. Do you get a lot of comparisons now to Robert De Niro, now that the movie The Irishman is on <laughs> yeah. Netflix a lot? Like, do people ask you about that movie and if you were there when all that was happening back then? I, yeah, I had to, ironically, I had to remind people the last few days. I've been like, in America, you guys have got so comfortable generalizing white people into the same category, regardless of how diverse their background might be, mm -hmm. that you made a 96-hour movie, called it The Irishman, and didn't even put any Irish people in it. And as a nation, you just went, yeah, yeah, that seems fine. Mm. So it was pretty ironic. It's yeah, no Irishman in that movie whatsoever. It's pretty disappointing when you're Irish. You're like, oh, we finally got our movie. We're open lights here. We're getting Oscar nominations. Which one of us is in it? Nobody. Not even <laughs> loosely. Not even an accent. No. Okay. Oh, man. It's like acceptable racism. Yeah, wild amounts of it. But it, it's def it definitely could be a lot worse. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to start the episode by apologizing on behalf of the American people <laughs> for and the, movie, the, the city Irishman. of Los Angeles. Yeah, I just changed the name. Just put one of us in there. Like, it's amazing that they use like all this enhancing technology so they wouldn't have to cast extra people in that movie. They oh, could yeah, at least right, brought right? in an Irish yeah. person somewhere. You know, it's funny though. I did have one of the executive producers on the show. Oh, nice. Earlier in the year, yeah. And he said he, he snubbed you guys on purpose. Just, no, hit, just him, hit, him, hit him for me. There's a whole nation okay. of us. Or just give us our movie. Yeah. Well, you were telling me earlier that one of the great things about being Irish is that if you do get into it with someone, pop them in the mouth, you can enjoy a nice pint afterwards. Well, I, yeah, we try not to hit too many people over here in America because you guys tend to frown upon that a bit right, more than you we hit, might have done. Meet a fellow up. Irishman. The bar. Isn't that the greeting? Isn't that like the? Hey. I've seen it happen. Okay. Like you try and right. defy the stereotypes, and then as I was telling you earlier, sometimes what you witness is is total lunacy. But yeah, it, it has happened. Boxing's a big part of growing up in Ireland. We're actually so good at boxing that in the last two Olympic medals, you Americans won forty six gold medals in each Olympic, which is scarily consistent. If it's scarily consistent if you're evaluating your performance. Mm. But over the last two Olympic Games, Ireland only won one gold medal, and that one's for women's boxing. Oh, really? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'm like, you talk about being woke in America, that's pretty woke in Ireland. Our yeah. women are knocking the life out of people. But she was funny because uh, um, her story is fascinating, and they actually flew her over to America, and they put her in front of the Olympic Committee, and they said, we want to make women's boxing part of the Olympics. And they said, well, show us how good it can be. So they put this girl up against a guy, and she was beating the life out of him. And they went, that's, that's how good it could be. And then sure enough, that was Katie Taylor, and that became our Olympic champion. Really? So, True story. They had her beat up a man? Yeah. Oh, she, she, she beat up numerous men, oh, and wow. she pretended to, she beat up numerous men, pretended to be a, a man a, a lot of times, or a young boy, when she was coming up boxing, because oh, women weren't allowed to box. And she was, she's so good. She's now a, a three-rate world champion. It was like ringside's uh, female fighter of the year this year. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, she is huge. So it's, it's funny how boxing, how closely linked it is yeah. to Ireland. Like all the Simpsons jokes are about Irish people going around boxing and fighting, but it, it is a big part of growing up and most people will have flirted with boxing at some stage. Oh yeah. And probably hit someone at some stage. Mm -hmm. What's she like in person? Oh, it's fantastic. Super religious. You guys which all is, know each other. All you people from Ireland, right? Like you I, and Connor are pretty tight. And, I wish. Yeah, yeah. But you'll you'll have come across someone who trains with them or trains them or knows okay. of them for the most part. And she's interesting because she's, she's very religious. 
Shush, they'd always be like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to beat up that woman last night. Oh, really? And you're thinking, no, I don't ah. know if those things go together. Yeah. No, she's fantastic. Yeah, right. Very skilled fighter. But yeah, our Irish people, we definitely like the boxing. So you grew Conor up McGregor's in McGregor's fighting Dublin? tonight, that they were recording this, I did. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And is it that kind of scrappy culture in the neighborhoods growing up? Yeah, like you, you're going to get into fights for sure. I remember it was the kind of thing, for some reason, when I grew up as a kid, the standard line was, what did you say about my mother? And you're like, I don't even know you. There's no way I said anything about your mother. And this guy would come down, they'd have a gang of people behind him, like, you said something about my mother. And you're like, I, I can assure you I didn't. But there was no room for negotiation. Before you knew it, someone had you on the ground, was kicking you in the head. And if you were going to get the better of that fight in any way, the 25 people that he had with him were now going to start piling in on you. Oh, so. Shit. I mean, that wasn't an irregular occurrence. I had that happen a lot, whereas mm. I was on some end of it. I was probably accusing someone at some stage of saying something about my mother that they never knew. And for some reason, that was the done thing. So, like, you definitely, you'd get into 50, fisticuffs quite a lot. You'd get into gang-orientated stuff where there'd be a decent amount of fights. And, you know, it wasn't that strange. It was... Whenever I tell stories about my American friends, I was like, whoa, you were doing that? Like, I, I remember a gang of us sitting on a wall once, and this guy, we saw him turning up, and he, he pulled in in a car. We were talking about cars earlier that were stolen. This car was blatantly stolen. He pulled in. The car was hot-wired, and we're about 14 years old, and we're all sitting on the wall outside a supermarket, and there's a bunch of stores in there, and for sure, this guy is going to go rob one of those stores. And at this day, there's no guns in Ireland like we grew up. There was never any guns. Police oh, okay. don't even have guns. So really? like if, if the cops were called, the cops would run after you, mm -hmm. and your chances of escape were pretty high. So you didn't really mm. fear them that much. They were, you usually weren't in the best shape. So they'd just be like, stop, or I'll run after you. And you'd be like, yeah, good for you, and off you went. And that was usually the last you heard of a lot of incidents. They wouldn't really track you down. It was funny. So we grew up like slightly wild. But I remember this guy came out. He had no gun, but he had a syringe. And the syringe was filled with tomato ketchup. And the whole line he had was, I have the AIDS in this syringe. I'm going to give you the AIDS. No. And that's how he was going to rob this pharmacy that was just part of the supermarket. And he went to rob it. And we knew this guy growing up. He was a bit of a lunatic. So we knew what he was doing. And while he was in there, we come up with the idea, like, wouldn't it be funny if we stole his getaway vehicle while he was in there robbing the place. So while he was in there, we got the car and we hot, it was already hot wired. So we just drove it around the corner and we put it out of sight. And this guy came out at full sprint with like a fistful of uh, money. And he had the syringe in his hand still. Oh, and man. he was moving at full speed. And we just sat back on the wall and just had to pretend like try and keep a straight face while this fella ran to the spot where his car was, just panicked. We were like, oh God, don't make eye contact. This is gonna be hilarious. And then just tore off in the other direction and the cops ended up turning up and catching up with him because he wasn't the best runner. I think we had his car for three days after that, just driving around in it. We're like, oh someone's going to come looking for this car oh, sooner yeah. or later. We're like, we might as well keep it. There's oh, no one wow. seems to be looking for it. Oh, wow. Did you guys do a lot of pranking? We did a lot of pranking, yeah. I think I, my favorite one as a kid, I know, we used to, you'd get milk delivered to your door in Ireland all the time, and if the milkman was a good one, he would deliver yogurt and strawberries as well. So as kids, a lot of the time, but yogurt and strawberries, you had to leave a special note to say that you wanted them, and they'd be added to your bill in a week's time. But yeah, we'd be forever leaving notes on people's doorsteps going, oh, I think I'll have some yogurt and strawberries tomorrow. And then, of course, we'd pick them up. They'd never knew oh, they got okay. delivered them, and off we mm. went. Ah. We were cheeky gits. I remember Sprite launch in Ireland. And they had mini cans, and they left a little can on everybody's doorstep in the whole neighborhood. And it must have been like 3,000 houses. It was a pretty big neighborhood we grew up around. And we stole every one of them. I never drank so much Sprite in my life. I <laughs> you guys are all high <laughs> yeah. on Sprite. They're like, we had a very unsuccessful launch penetration in the Irish market in certain suburbs in Dublin. We had no traction. I'd say we're like, yeah, we have a lot of Sprite. We oh. worked out well out of it. Is that why Sprite is a green can that should appeal to Irish? Possibly. It hmm. doesn't just have to be green to appeal to us, though. We're fairly, we're fairly liberal. But yeah, we were cheeky kids. We did a lot of stuff growing up. I stole a lot of wreaths. I'm not proud to wreaths? say that. You like know Christmas the Christmas wreaths? wreaths? Yeah, we used, oh, man. we used to cut them off and we'd sell them to the neighbor across the street. We'd be oh, like, geez. yeah, my mother makes these by hand and the money's for charity. And we didn't have any money. We'd have a pile of wreaths somewhere. Oh, we were a disaster. Oh, man. <laughs> That's you wild. steal the petrol tanks from uh, construction vehicles? Oh, that one was particularly bad. 
They have, oh, like the ones that are hanging on the side. Yeah, we used to drain them. They'd either be diesel or petrol, and we would train them and make, around Halloween, we'd make bombs out of those, and we'd put them into bomb fires. Yeah, so people, and people wouldn't know this was in the gas can. So we were such lunatics when we were growing up that we'd put that within the bomb fire, and someone would light the bomb fire that night, thinking it's just going to gradually catch fire, (laughs) and the thing would explode into life. Oh, jeez. And we, as just a bunch of delinquent 13 or 14-year-olds, would be the ones buying that one. Oh, wow. Did you yeah, have a weird pop disaster? Any of this stuff? Did the cops ever catch up with you? Yeah, but like they wouldn't really do anything. I think I remember st- I got stealing a bunch of hamburgers and air. You steal. I don't know why I'm stealing. <laughs> oh, <it's> like, like, <laughs> I don't know why I'm like stealing. Frozen patties? Or frozen patties. Out of, out frozen patties. Yeah, that was okay. sad. I don't know why. Would you I, shove them down your pants? I had them down my pants. I okay. had a big jacket. It was like an Arsenal football team jacket. And it was a bit loose in the middle, and I could stuff amazingly large stuff in there and still get out of this place without getting caught. Oh, so I just and collect- were you really craving a hamburger, or were you, was this yeah. a personal challenge? No, so. Someone said we'll do a barbecue, a grill or something. It might have been during the summer, and that would be a bit of a rarity when you get good weather in Ireland. So I was like, oh, I'll go up and steal a few burgers for that, and that didn't work out well. I'd steal a bunch of Easter eggs a few months back, and oh. it was amazing that the size of the stuff I was getting good Hard at. Hard to run with meat in your pants, huh? Hard to run with meat. Extra meat extra in your meat. pants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most you dudes are okay saw, with yeah. some level of yeah, meat in yeah. their yeah. pants. Hey, I hope you're enjoying these stories as much as I am. I want to know from you, who should I interview next? Maybe it's your favorite celebrity, your favorite athlete, your favorite author, or just someone you know who has a story that's never been told before. Comment below, let me know who it is, and then hit that subscribe button so you get notified when I interview the person that you pick. Yeah, yeah. sad but true. And I remember your man caught me, but we used to rob, rob uh, aerosol cans. I think it was around the time we'd just start sweating and you wouldn't have that much money at home. It'd be a bit embarrassing asking your parents to buy deodorant for you because you weren't really sure what was going on with your body as a oh, dude. Right, but right. you knew like everybody stank at school. Yeah. So I started stealing the aerosol cans and then we realized yeah, if you put a lighter to them, it made a pretty good uh, flamethrower. So we used to go up to the fields and just burn mass quantities of gorse bushes, which I think... Yeah, for anyone listening out there who's like, you guys were lunatics. I think they were burning those anyway sooner or later to clear fields. But yeah, right. we definitely burned a lot of them. Yeah, and I heard they had a hamburger excess in Ireland that actually helped when you that, guys would yeah, steal them. That would have made sense. At know, least I was yeah, having a fire and yeah. stealing hamburgers. But yeah, yeah, I think I remember I got caught stealing. I got caught doing all sorts of stuff, but I got caught stealing hamburgers properly where like the cops came and then they assign you a juvenile liaison officer. So like oh, man. once a month, I think this cop used to come into your bedroom in your house there early on a Saturday morning just be sitting on your bed talking to you asking you how things were going he didn't search your room or anything right no it was, it was okay. weird nothing nothing really happened like two of the lads when we grew up I remember they bought a mini cooper and they bought this mini cooper at the age of 15 I think you have to be 17 at the time to legally able to drive in Ireland and the mini cooper the brakes didn't work on it properly so they were just hoping to get it down the mountain without getting in any trouble and it, it was a really narrow old country road and a cop car pulled up behind them and was like pull over and the two lads couldn't pull over because the brakes didn't work and they were already going downhill. And the cop car pulled some maneuvers somehow to get around them to block them, not knowing that their brakes didn't work. So they drove up onto a ditch. The car rolled and ended up upside down on the cop car. Two guys who are 15 years old, shouldn't have a car in the first place, oh, no shit. driver's license, no insurance, and just nothing happened. There was no, <laughs> really? there was nowhere to get sent in that time in Ireland. There was oh. no rehabilitation facilities for like kind of nearly young offenders, you'd call them at the time. So. Yeah, it was weird. For just, there wasn't that many rules. It was mm. funny. It takes a lot of getting used to to come to America and adapt to a society that just loves rules. Where like you have rules for everything here, and ah, most people are pretty emotionally tied to them. Yeah, is the stereotype of Irish folks drinking a lot an actual real thing? Yeah, but like not to the extent it was. We're certainly the health kick that's gone on here in California, and the health kick that's gone on in the states, and the outdoors living, and the more health conscious. Mm-hmm. That's a, a big part of Irish culture at the moment as well. You'll see it in the mm-hmm. food, you'll see it in the changes. I mean, we now have 18% immigration in Ireland, and when we grew up, I was pretty much the brownest kid. Like in my neighborhood, mm. there was one other lad that had a fair bit of a tan, that would get pretty tan in the summer, and it was pasty now. But I normally go brown in the summer, and nobody else did. They were just going red and oh. getting sunburnt. Okay. So all of a sudden, you would have heard the expression black Irish. Yeah, kind of. That, in, in, well, it was in relation to a lot of uh, Spanish blood around the coast of Ireland from kind of sailors and armadas and, and different mm. passings through and trading back in the days. But my dad would be very dark skinned in the summer as well. Mm. So I think with that change, it, there's still a big drink and culture there, but it's not as nuts as it was, you know, with drink driving regulations coming in. Like oh, when yeah. we were kids, we'd get pulled over to cops. We're like 18. 
and they'd say, how many beers did you have? And you'd say, oh, I just had one or two. And they'd be like, tell me the truth now. You'd go, oh, one or two. Like, tell me the truth. And you'd be like, I had eight. And like they'd say, <laughs> right then, we better get this car home for you. Okay. There, was, there was nothing happened there at that moment other than the, we need to get you off the road. And where yeah. do you live? We'll make sure we get your car home yeah. for you. But I remember that happening a couple of times. And I'm like, this is crazy. Anywhere else you'd be in a world of trouble right now. Oh, wow. What was it like when you guys got electricity over there? Yeah, we, thing, no, right? we've had, it's amazing how advanced we are compared to most countries on everything. I mean, we, we were, we're very, very, very first world. Hopefully you're taking the piss on the other <laughs> Well, you know what's interesting, though, is a lot of the biggest tech companies in the world now have headquarters in Dublin. Like oh, no, they are. Facebook for, and Apple and Google. For a reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing there on the, there's nothing there we grew up without, but we just weren't the most, we definitely were not a first world nation when I grew up, and we would have been one of the poorer economies in Europe growing up. Mm. But, I mean, you weren't lacking for anything of a first world infrastructure. But the move to Europe and the move to being part of the European economy and being early adapters to adapt everything from the euro currency itself. I think we were the second country to take that on in Europe, and I think we were the first one to ban smoking. Um, so I think we, we've, our population all of a sudden has gone from a little bit old to one that whereas I think the average age, like 40% of the people are 29 years old or under. So every single thing that we brought in recently has just passed. And we'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. So they're like, gay marriage? Yeah, let's make it legal. And we're the first country in the whole world by popular vote to do that. And we have a half Indian gay prime minister at the moment. And like when I was a kid, I was born in 1979. And that was the last time the Pope had visited Ireland until two years ago. So can you imagine the Pope leaving Ireland in 1979? Now granted, it's a different Pope that comes back, but that would have been the one of the hotbeds of Catholicism. Now he's gonna come back and get beaten by a half Indian gay prime minister as the leader of Ireland and be like, Jesus, this place changed a lot since I was gone. So from being quite a backwards place when I was a kid where we wouldn't have had, I don't think I knew anyone who was born anywhere else growing up. There, there was no real immigrant community going on in any way, shape or form. For now you're walking around Dublin, you'll just hear Portuguese everywhere and you'll hear Spanish everywhere. We have a huge oh, wow. amount of Brazilians in Ireland. Which is a good way if anyone's ever anti-immigration, just bring Brazilians and you'd be like, you want more of these people. Surely you do. We went, oh, we definitely do. And I think long term, our football team will probably be a lot better for it as well. Yeah. We'll see. But yeah, it's interesting. We were a bit backwards and now we're very forwards very quickly. So whenever I see things happen in America, they're a bit weird. Or certain states in America that you're like, they're kind of backwards and there's no hope for them. You're like, well, you would have said Ireland was pretty historically backwards, but all of a sudden we're one of the more kind of liberal, modern places in the world where the only English native speaking country within the European monetary region. And then when we paired up with the EU, a lot of the third level education was free. Like I went to university for free for six years to three different universities. And most Irish people would have gone on to third level education and were highly literate. It's pretty weird. We had more Nobel prizes than China up until last year, I think, which is pretty crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, now we don't have a huge amount of them, but neither did yeah. China. So it's a pretty interesting statistic. So what did your path look like? So a little bit of a wild youth, and then when did you come over to America? Yeah, I definitely had a wild youth. Did you, did you, were you still a wild man when you came over here and had to no, I abide by the rules? I calmed down a bit. Did you go I, to college? or what? It took? That's going to college made a difference because you okay. kind of branch out from your, your network of friends, you know. So what you think is nuts or not is normally established by your group of friends. And in so Ireland, I sure? was like, <laughs> I thought it wasn't that nuts. Okay. I was like, no, pretty normal. And then we'd be within our group. We were like, we haven't been doing anything that crazy. And then you get to university, and they're kind of looking at me. You're, you're, you're. No, that was a bit wild. And then, <laughs> then you get like to that. America, and they're like, you're insane. How did you even survive that, man? Mm. I think it was going to university. I got an apprenticeship as an electrician, and I remember just sitting in a room with like sixteen other dudes farting and just talking about women and not really doing any electrical work. And I remember thinking, this isn't a good way to spend four years. The apprenticeship's meant to be four years. Uh, the lowest pay rate that you can imagine for four years while you're doing your training. Ironically, we were building uh, one of Intel's four campuses in Dublin, or three campuses. Oh, wow. So it would have been That's a huge job. big tech company over there. Yeah. Huge. I mean, we have them all because mostly we have a preferential tax rate that right. allowed us to attract them all. But then you have a very educated English-speaking workforce, and you're in Europe, and it, it just kind of makes sense. So the, the tax rate gets a lot of attention on it. But yeah, I, I didn't want to be an electrician anymore pretty quick. I was like, all right, do I have an opportunity to go to university? So I did, I applied to one and I got in. And that, that kind of changed everything. The people I met there and the circle of people I was around and what their idea of, of normal was and 
avenues they were looking at for careers that I just never even thought about. I didn't mm. think I could get into any university, and then yeah. I got into one, and then someone's like, oh, well, if you do this, you can get into the best university in Ireland, kind of through the back door if your grades are good enough and you apply and there's only a certain amount of positions, but it's possible. And I think everything in life is just meeting someone who influences you in a certain way where your you're ch- thinking just gets changed. And you're yeah. like, geez, I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. And I remember transferring in, and sure enough, I got into the best university we had in Ireland. And someone said, oh, well, you're in here now. You can do this exchange program to go to Montreal and Canada or any of these places. So mm. I ended up going to McGill University in Montreal. I think we were the first and last maybe Irish exchange students to go. We were wild when we went over. Oh, man. Did you yeah. pull the meat in the pants thing again? There was no meat in the pants, but there was a, <laughs> there was a decent amount of drinking. I, think okay. I, got, I got that smashed on St. Patrick's Day that somehow I started drinking in Montreal. And I woke up in Boston, and I was like, how the hell did I get to Boston? And there was no plane involved, and I had no clue, and I had new clothes on me, and it was all like weird promotional stuff, and I had like flashing green chains. And, you know, you Americans on St. Patrick's Day, you love getting cheesy for it. So whatever cheesy merchandise was going, I had it. And I, I wasn't sober for a long few more drinks, and then I remember waking up back in Montreal, and I was thinking, I haven't a clue how I got here. And when I woke up, I was covered in an Italian flag, and a couple of the lads were just laughing at me, and they're, they're Canadian guys. And they were like, we told you there's no such thing as an Irish restaurant in Canada as you were climbing that Italian restaurant to steal what you thought was your own country's flag, and I'm just wrapped in an Italian flag. Oh, I was boy. like, oh boy, this was a rough session. <laughs> sure enough, some Canada guy was like, oh, you guys are Irish, we're going to Boston to celebrate. That's where they really celebrate, St. Patrick's Day, uh, and bought a bunch of beer and just kept us drinking, and we got in the car and went down five or six hours drive. So. That explained that one, but it took a couple of days to figure it out. So we were still a little bit wild in college, but but not nuts. Then you, you just meet people that are quite career-focused within a college trajectory, and they're like, hey, you could do this, that, and the other. And then I think I, I did an exchange program to, I know, a summer in New Hampshire, of all places. Have you ever been there? It's funny, the state motto is live free or die. So we were like, this is the place for a bunch of Irish people living together. I'll never forget, we got in a taxi, leaving a very good life lesson is to be careful what you're saying about other people in any language, because we talk, we, were all, we all know Gaelic Irish, because in, in, in Ireland, we, we have proudly our own language, but we were kind of forced to study it for the most part through school for nearly a minimum of 11 or 12 years. So you might not be using it fluently, but you have enough to make fun of someone pretty comfortably in another language. So the taxi driver stank that we got into and we were all on our way, just arrived off the airport, we are going up to live in New Hampshire and we just made fun of him, which he smelled the whole way there. And then as soon as we got out, he's like said, turned around and said to us in Gaelic Irish, be careful what you're saying about people over here, you never know where they're from. And we were just like, oh no. Wow. We ended up living in this little That's town, New Hampshire, and their state motto was live free or die. And on the first day, two of us got arrested for open container violations. And we're like, you can't be live free or die. <laughs> and then, but the Irish container. guy, don't yeah. open that beer. Oh, man. So it's a weird introduction to living in America to stop off in uh, New Hampshire first. But pretty funny. I ended up working on a whale watching boat, of all things. And I knew nothing mm. about whales. So Just like, what kind of helping with the tourists in and out? Yeah, I was run, okay. running the tour. Yeah. I meant to be explaining whales to them. I was like, I don't know. Oh, you're running about tour. whales. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I guess they were stuck for people over the summer. So, when did the leap come to you getting on stages? Yeah, that was a big leap. I, I was very good at hiding at stages. And I think in, in university in Ireland, we, I think we universally fear public speaking so much over there in any way, shape, or form that you're nearly able to hide from it most of your time, all, nearly all the way through university. Like, you'll have one or two presentations. Yeah. But it's not like America where they're like, oh, we're doing the weekly or the monthly presentation mm. or you're presenting your work. For some reason, I think even the professors in Ireland might hate it or be so conscious that the students are so uncomfortable with it that they don't really or it never was forced upon us in any way until one or two things. And there was just no hiding from those things. And I was so nervous about doing one in Ireland that I remember buying a six pack of Corona and sitting in a room with these exchange students that were on our group. And I was like, I need to drink these before I'm gonna do this presentation. They're like, this is a horrendous idea. Why you're living up to every stereotype here. Just down in Corona is like, a, strangely enough, Corona is, the, Ireland is the largest consumer of Corona beer per capita in the world outside of Mexico. So it's really taken off over oh, wow. there. We're like, we'll give you our Guinness and we'll take yeah. your Corona. Thank you very much. But yeah, I, just, I hated public speaking so much I would be willing to do something that stupid and drink. And I got up and introduced myself as, as an exchange student from southern Yemen and everyone just looked at me. I thought it was hilarious. They thought I was insane. And I was like, I'm never doing this again. 
And I, I hid from public speaking nearly at every opportunity mm. I got. And it was funny, when I start getting into the professional ladder a bit, I had an opportunity to host an event on behalf of a business school that I was running. And it was going to be Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, was going to be there, and the mayor of San Francisco, and they wanted me to host it. Because you were running a, a As business a, school? Yeah, okay. I, I don't know. That, that was, somehow I ended up setting up a, a business school on, in, um, or one of the campuses for Holt International Business School, which is, um, is a pretty fascinating company. They're owned by EF, a Swedish company, which is the world's largest private education company. Mm. And I've never heard of them, but I ended up working for them and setting up a bunch of their campuses around the world. But it was quite an opportunity. I was when I went from like stealing rates and being a lunatic back in Ireland to somehow getting a good job, somehow blagging me way into good universities, and somehow they're like, "Oh, we might have you as the executive director of our largest business school, and you're going to be in the heart of Silicon Valley, and here's the mayor of San Francisco, and here's one of the founders of Apple, and we want you to be the face of this. You're going to host it." Oh, and wow. I was like, "No way!" I was just getting flashbacks of the Corona bottles and ah. introduced myself to the guy from Southern Yemen and anything negative that ever happened with public speaking, and I didn't do it. And I think it hurt me a bit in the company because that was a chance for me to really kind of stand up and go, all right, this is, I put a lot of work into this. I'm the face of this. Let me help you guys going forward. And I think in shying away from it, it definitely hurt me a bit. And I, I just stayed away from all stages until a friend of mine suffered a, a severe spinal cord injury. And I remember I screwed up my knee wakeboarding and I'd been in the hospital for seven days. It was around the time, remember they had all the flesh-eating bacteria? Yeah. And everyone was like, oh, I could just eat you from within. Well, so I, I like cut my knee, it opened, and then it swelled, my leg swelled to twice the size of my other one. And I got brought into hospital, and they're like, yeah, it could be this flesh-eating stuff, oh, we don't really nice. know. And then they were like, you might use your knee. And I ended up in there for seven days, and I'd never been in hospital before, so I don't think, I'd never really been sensitive to it. When somebody got injured, I was like, ah, oh, they'll be out in a while. Like, it's not that bad. I visit them, but I just, it wouldn't weigh on my mind right, the whole time. never done it. Yeah, I think until you've been through it. And when I came out, I was just more sensitive to it. If anyone was sick or if anyone was hurt, I was all about it. And I remember my friend was meant to come over and visit me, and he didn't show up. And I thought, it's very unusual that he didn't come to visit me when I got out of the hospital. He's a very reliable fella. And then I got a text message to say that he'd fallen from a third-story balcony, and he'd shattered his spine, and they didn't know if he was ever going to walk again. Mm. And I just remember that moment just going, Jesus. I never, for somebody else, I've had feelings for other people, but I think I was just so sensitive to it after coming out of the hospital that I just remember thinking, Jesus, I thought I went through something with this little thing I had in my knee that wasn't a whole lot compared to what he's about to go through. And his insurance company had cut him off and all these providers had said, you're never going to walk again and we're not going to fund you trying to walk again or stand again. And he had a very nice American crew of friends that were just very different to what I'd grown up with, like very positive, very like, no, we can... You know, very American in the nicest way possible, but we can do this. We can help you. And it kind of rubbed off me. So I was like, oh, maybe I could organize a, a charity night and we try and make some money that he can use towards his insurance. And I just happened to know a comedian who'd been the next door neighbor. And I said, hey, would you do this? And do you know any other headliners you could recommend that could do it? And then my friend who had the spinal cord injury was like, that's, that's a great idea. You're going to, you're going to host it, right? Like you're always talking. You, you host it. And I was like, no, I can't. He's like, come on, you're going to host it. You have to. Yeah, and I just remember weighing on me that thinking, like, I honestly would have called public speaking a crippling fear until that moment. And I'm like, I can't even think about it in those terms anymore compared to someone who's facing the reality of potentially being crippled. And uh, that was the moment where I was like, all right, I got to try and get over this fear or at least face it a little bit. And I want to do this event and I don't want to look like an idiot. And it's a comedy event, so I don't want to be not funny. Oh, man. Uh, how do I figure it out? Yeah. And that was a very deep rabbit hole into all things stand-up comedy because it just, one, the event was going to be comedy, so it made sense. But two, I was reading a lot of Malcolm Gladwell and Tim Ferriss and A.J. Jacobs, and it was kind of accumulation of their train of thought, whereas t it takes 10,000 hours to make a master of something from the Malcolm Gladwell and Tim Ferriss. You can kind of figure out anything and break it down to its finer points and replicate it to some extent. And then A.J. Jacobs wrote a lot of books where he went into a topic deeply for one year and wrote about it. So I was like, well, maybe I, it was kind of those three influences coming together where I was like, maybe I'll just do this with comedy and keep it going. Like if I don't embarrass myself horrendously with this charity event. And I didn't, the event went great. 
And one of the main comedians was like, that was so good. Do you want to come and open for me? Uh, there was the Punchline Comedy Club in San Francisco, which oh, is wow. a pretty epic venue. And so wait, what did you do first when you're like, okay, I need to test this. Event. Did you read comedy books or something like that? Because if you went yeah, from I, I read everything. Like stage to having a comedian. I read open for everything I could get my hands on because okay. that seemed the easiest way first. And then the funny thing with stand up, there's really no substitute for putting some time in actually in front of an audience of people. So they had this thing in San Francisco, so it was San Francisco Comedy College. And I was like, oh, that sounds horrendous. I'll sign up for that. That scared the life out of me. And they, were, they would make you get on stage as part of it, so no choice. And they had a venue that was the downstairs basement of an Irish bar that looked like there'd been a breakdown in communications between like Irish laborers and, and Mexican contractors or one way or the other. It does look kind of abandoned. So they had a mic and a stage, and it had nine or ten people that would strike fear into your heart, but were there to be made laugh if you could do it. And that was the first place I ever jumped up and did it. Hmm. And then uh, you just got kind of, once you, you pop the cherry in that, so to speak, and you're like, right, that's out of the way. I've got my duck out of the way. You, you find your way to open mics or some sort of showcase events that you can get on in front of an audience. And I just went up as much as I possibly could and kept that going for a year. Oh, wow. And like I sweated out my clothes every single time, my hands every <laughs> single time were dripping. And it never changed, but you just, you just are putting yourself through it. And it gets slightly more comfortable, but never it never feels native to do it, but it feels still less scary to do it. Yeah, to this day, still to this day, when there's consequences, you always feel oh, the nerves always kick back in. When there's mm. no consequences, sometimes you can do it and it feels very normal. Okay. It can feel just like talking. Yeah. Wow. But I think that was the way I was trying to do it. Like I was dyslexic, so I never really sat down and wrote anything. I just went, oh, well, these are funny things that have happened. Maybe I'll tell other people about them and maybe they'll think they're funny. Yeah. Like, here's something someone said to me in a bar. Maybe that's funny. Here's my way of viewing the world. I'm kind of angry. I would say this anyway on or off stage. Let me, let me just share this opinion and see if they think it. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, what you taught me when I first saw you speak that blew my mind was at one point in your career, you studied the TED Talks and you saw the most popular TED Talks. Yeah. I had way too much laughs. time on my hands. Well, they were all funny. It was the one thing nobody had ever correlated all the world's leading TED Talks for humor just because it's, it's a bit labor intensive. There's no easy way to do it. You just have to watch them and record audience reactions and monitor the laughter levels in it to ah. cue for laughter. So comedians use a metric, not all the time, but it's definitely well known, a metric called laughs per minute, how many times people, the audience will laugh per minute at your stuff. And the world's leading TED Talks, like every one of them were funny and some of them were really funny. Like some of them were up around... 2.5 to 3.5 laughs per minute. So like the most popular one of all time is Ken Robinson's talk to Schools Killed Creativity. And he was making people laugh nearly three times per minute. Hmm. There's a lot. It's not a million miles off comedy. Good comedians are up around five. Wow. But it's, wow. it's not that much a level for... If I said to you, you you're, do you want to watch something funny tonight? Yeah. You in the mood for some humor? Yeah. Okay. Uh, TED Talks. Yeah. You wouldn't normally make that correlation, but I just think a lot of entertainment, inter, entertainment in the world today has become kind of infotainment, where people are scrolling so quick through their devices and so saturated with content, they want a bit of light relief, they want a little bit of humor, and I think to grab their attention, no matter what you're talking about these days, people are nearly used to receiving information with a level of entertainment, and that was clear definitely in TED Talks. Mm, yeah, and then you began doing story competitions, am I right? Yeah, I did a lot of storytelling stuff because I think it kind of comes native naturally to Irish people. Mm. It's weird. I don't think you see a lot of Irish stand-up comedy on television over here because I think in Ireland you usually don't have five-minute spots that can make a break or career on late-night television. There are no late-night television spots, so there's no need to you for you to be super concise and do something in five minutes, so we naturally have a kind of longer-winded storytelling way of using more words where an American audience might be used to less. Not all the time, but I just think that's kind of our, our natural strength to do storytelling stuff. So yeah, I went and did a storytelling show and they'd pull names out of a hat and I nearly laid an egg. I was so nervous. And of course, there's 10 names get pulled out and of course I get pulled last. So I've sweated out everything I have, but then I won it. And they're like, now do you win it? Oh, you have to go and do this thing. It's in front of 1600 people. I was in the Castro Theater in San Francisco. And then I was like, oh, well, I can't chicken out of that, can I? So I went and did that. And that, that one, I just told a story, and my, I had, that, that was the accumulation of a year of going around and doing all these shows under the stage name Irish Dave and not telling any of my friends about it because Irish people would normally not be very supportive with silly ideas like that. Oh, Wait, okay. you're going to pretend to be a comedian for a year, make no money, 
just yeah. to get over a fear of public speaking. Horrendous plan. So I didn't want to tell anyone about that. And how the nice thing with the 1,600 people did you? Oh, uh, it was well, it was rough emotionally. But to okay. be honest, I'd done this stuff so many times that when I got up and talked, it is just I looked very comfortable, even though I'm anything but comfortable on stage. And it went. My friend Arash had some that suffered the spinal cord injury. He had got wind that I was in this storytelling thing because he sent me an invite for it. And I said, "Oh yeah, I, I think I might be there." I didn't say I was in it. And then he's like, oh, I just read through the fine print. I'm pretty sure this is your photo. And I was mm. like, oh, no. So we invited like 30 of our friends. And they're all sitting up the back. And I I think I just self-published my book. And I had been approached by a publisher to then sell it to a publisher. And they wanted me to update the ending and the beginning and the content. So I was like, oh, if I win this big storytelling competition, it'll be a pretty good end. That'll be the end I need to the book. And sure enough, my argument was the comedians are the world's true masters of public speaking. There was 10 people in this competition and three of them were comedians. And as we got down to the very last person, I was winning and the other two com comedians were second and third. So everything kind of I theorized was falling into place a little bit. And then this lady went up and she was amazing and funnier than everybody else. And she won. She went last. I went, and this one I went fourth or fifth, so I was kind of winning all the way through. And then I was like, well, there goes the end of that story uh, for the book. And I went up and I asked her, like, you, you were amazing. Like, have you read anything? I remember, I think I told you this before, I wasn't told to type, but I just, I was so excited. I was like, how were you so good? Have you done comedy or stage tra training or acting or improv? She's like, no, I just read a lot about it. And I was like, what did you read? I'm about to publish this book again. And she pulled up cliff notes on her phone from my book. And she's like, I read this book by a guy called Dave Norhill. She didn't put the stage name and the real name together. And I was like, oh, you're joking me. And oh, I remember just yeah. thinking that was the end of it. And then there was a guy who was big into comedy that also ran a TED Talk series. And he hit me up and he said, oh, I like that story you told the other night. Would you like to come and tell it at a TED series I'm running? And I said, well, actually, my friend Arish has a much better story. Would you consider having him on? And he had him close out the event. And he got to go tell the story of how he he refused to give up on standing on his own two feet again and how he'd actually managed that by training every single day for a full year because he wanted to propose to his girlfriend eye to eye. It was pretty cool. A few of my friends had hidden around the dock in Lake Tahoe on a beautiful day and they're ready to catch the moment because she didn't know he was able to stand up out of the wheelchair. Oh, wow. And he wasn't able to walk at, at, at okay. this stage and he, it's still something he's been working on a lot. But just the fact that he could stand on his own two feet to propose to her and they caught the moment on camera and of course she said yes. And he got to tell the story as a TED Talk. So it was pretty cool. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great because it was it, it, one thing you know, I get asked a lot about humor. What if I have a serious topic? Should I be using humor in it? And the serious topics nearly have more room to use that humor within them because people need to let off tension. Yeah, it was cool. There was a moment where I was backstage and he got like a 52 second standing ovation, I want to say, as, as he stood, stood up out of a wheelchair. Oh, wow. And she joined him live on stage. What and he had such a serious topic and people are always asking, how do you use humor in a serious topic? But he'd used a lot of comedians' techniques within that topic just to allow them to release the tension because they're sitting there going like, whoa, this guy's in a so tough heavy. situation. Yeah. yeah, oh, interesting. So what was the story that you told? Can you tell it here? It starts in the action. There's no fluff or introduction yeah. in any way. I think I said something like, as I stood on the back of the boat and jumped, I knew something's wrong. And it's, but you're trying to create, uh, you're trying to let them see where you are at that moment in time. You're trying to tell it in the present tense. So I think I might have said, I'm standing on the back of the boat and I see. And if I didn't, that would have been a mistake that I'd learned in time. I was still kind of pretty new to all the okay. big stage. And I, I didn't realize that great live storytellers will always take you in the moment, in the action, and they'll use the present tense where possible. Okay. So they're never, I'm walking and I saw. They're like, I'm standing and I see. I'm standing, not I was walking. Yeah, I'm standing. I'm standing and I okay. see. Right in front of me okay. is, and they just tell it in the present ah, tense. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to put that in right now. And when you watch this clip, Focus on what Dave was just sharing, how he starts right in the action, speaks in the present tense, and, it, and well, these questions I don't know, pop up in your I mind. wish I was doing that in that one. I'm not sure if I did. I definitely would have done it by the second time, but it's just something. What I did definitely in this one was set the scene, start in the action, okay. no fluff, allow the tension to be released, address the obvious that I'm Irish, and now get into the story and get a laugh quick. So it, it kind of has quick all laugh that. Is yeah, too. yeah okay. just to let them know it's going to be kind of fun. All right. Here it is. Thank you. When yeah, you're yeah. watching yourself doing something back, it's kind of cringeworthy. But I remember in that one, someone had told me, I told a story in a theater 
I somehow BS my way into a theater and they're like, we'll give you a spot. What's your lighting and your sequence? You have 20 minutes to do your piece. And I was like, peace? I don't have a script or lighting. Or... I was just going to tell a story. And I told the same story in every detail I could remember around it. And I remember thinking, that was great. There's no way I could make it shorter. And these guys said, yeah, we want you to come to the Castro Theater thing, 1,600 people, but it's got to be six minutes. I was like, there's no way it could be six minutes. And then when I watch, if I look at the video, I'm like, that could have been four minutes. Oh, like, what was the extra fluff that I had in there? But it's just funny when you have no one to help you edit, it can be a tough time to say, well, what actually needs to be in my talk? Right. Because it's just, tough to edit yourself. Yeah. I learned the hard way. Someone told me along the way just to score everything within your story or your talk from one to five and base that on, say, it's give it a five if the reactions are good from the audience, if it's central to the story, if you love telling it and the audience love hearing it. And then score the other things. And you'll get to a point where you're like, yeah, that has a one. I don't even know why I put it in there. Oh, that has a two. Nobody ever comments on that. And just to make it numerical so you're not, it takes the emotional connect you have with some of the contents of your own story out. Because you're like, yeah, nobody ever asked me about that. I don't even know why I put it in there. It doesn't get a laugh. And then you try and shorten it and shorten it so you constantly just have three, fours, and fives in there. And you just constantly get rid of all the ones and twos and make it shorter. Oh, I love that because I have such a hard time editing my own stories Everybody or my does. own sales and marketing materials when I write them. You just fall in love with the sentences. Well, you wrote that, it. You, you like know. it. You're yeah. like, I love that line. I don't want to yeah. take it. Like, I'll go off in a tangent something for another three minutes just because I like it. But an editor would be like, don't do that. It right. makes no sense. Yeah. I love the Mark Twain quote. If I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. Yeah. Because that's the time. Yep. that it takes, but that is the difference. It makes a difference when you're putting a story out there. You don't yeah, want to. And, you want and to optimize used, it well, the most amount of people, right? 100%. And watch the next time somebody writes you a text message. You're like, if they couldn't even take the time to make sure that came to you in one bubble as one concise talk, like, that's what we've got used to doing. Well, I have a talk, I'll just send it, and oh, here's another one four seconds later. Here's another one five seconds later. So just take a minute and think about what you want mm -hmm. to write to me and put it in one bubble. But we don't even do that. So we kind of have that living and lifestyle and mindset of how we communicate. But we can just throw random dots out there with no editing. Yeah. But it, it's nearly dangerous when you bring that to public speaking because an audience, you lose them pretty quick because the same rules don't apply. Yeah. They don't let you get away with that. And now you work with some of the top TED speakers and executives from Fortune 500 companies, help yeah. them with their speaking. And... I love the concept you taught me. And again, it's about capturing as much of the audience as possible yep. of that way to say an opening line that everyone can relate to. Yeah. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it, it's just, so if I was saying like, oh, I went to China and this happened, like a lot of people will be like, well, I've never been to China. I don't care about China. But if I say I was in a new place or even better, new places can be challenging. Adapting to a new environment can be challenging. Nearly everybody has adapted to a new environment, so I'm just allowing myself to hit the widest amount of people in the room rather than starting with a statement that narrows that. So some people will treat it like a lawyer and they'll go in and they'll make their argument like, we need to change the rules because of this. Well, surely there's going to be people in the room that don't agree with that opening statement and you usually lose them yeah. at that moment because they become nearly adversarial. Like We're naturally argumentative, so for sure half the audience are going to be like, Oh, I don't agree with that. And now you have a hard time convincing them. Whereas if you just walk them down the path, like start with a very wide funnel and be like, hey, everybody, this we've got to get everybody on side here. And then my opinion is going to be hidden down here a little bit. But we're going to get to it. It doesn't have to be up top. Yeah. And I think it's, it's just it makes it easier for speakers to relate to more people in the audience because some elements of speaking make it a bit of a popularity contest. And you're losing it already if you throw out an opinion at the start or a way that doesn't allow people to relate to you. Yeah. I used to tell people to start with a yes question. And I still think it's a pretty good idea. Yeah. If you ask something like, you know, have you ever been in a point in your life where you felt stuck, frustrated up against a wall? And then everyone puts their hands up. Yeah. But after I started learning from you, now I change that. Now I'm worse. And I say, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> no. but now I say... Things like, we've all been in places in our lives when we we're stuck and frustrated and just feeling like nothing's going right for us. Yeah. And everyone's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we've you all get had at least nods. one of those moments. You get more head nods, but I think for those questions, a lot of people are lazy. They're like, I don't even want to put up my hand, whatever. I don't want to participate. Yeah, in they this kind talk. of feel like they're being manipulated in a they, way. They do. And yeah. a, a lot of people do it, and a lot of people will do the flip side of it. They're like, okay, who here hasn't? had a moment and then you'll always have a few people 
So don't put up their hand for either or, and then it's an easy laugh to say. And some of you are just like, I'm not putting up the hand today. That's excessive calories that I don't want to waste here in this talk. And everybody has a little bit of a laugh. But oh, that's good so one. some speakers use it for that, but or just to get a reaction out of everybody in the room. But I think it's better just to make a statement that they're likely to agree with that it is not a tough statement in any way. Mm, so it's yeah. like if I went, to, I was giving a talk in San Francisco, and I was like, Oakland is a is a crazy place, isn't it? For sure, half the room are going to go, well, I, I know, I like Oakland, I live there, I've relocated there recently, I successfully worked there. But if I phrase that where I say Oakland can be an interesting place sometimes, they all know that I mean a similar thing, but you haven't, you haven't really said anything with that statement, you haven't offended anyone with that statement. Most people are likely to nod and agree, oh yeah, it can definitely be interesting. It has its ups and its downs, but it allows me to just ease them into a topic rather than forcing it upon them. So it's just that generic opening statement. But it, it's quite formulaic in, in TED Talks these days. If you watch them, you'll tend to see that there's a, there's a generic opening statement that's, that's appealing to most people that they'll agree with. And then there's a central idea that they're going to talk some more about it. And then if they're good, whatever they introduce at the start, they'll circle back to in the end to give it that feeling of conclusion, kind of gotcha. like a movie. When so you're you, like, if you start with a general opening idea that most people can agree with, then you can more likely put out your idea yep. that they might not agree with, but they'll be more open-minded to hearing you out. Isn't exactly. That right? Yeah, it allows you to build your argument before you say conclusively, this is how I think. And, and sometimes mm. you don't have to force it home by saying, I think it's one way to hear. Sometimes you can just present them with the facts and walk them to a logical conclusion that you want to walk them to. But it's a lot of times when I do comedy and I tell them about Ireland, I'm not telling them I'm liberal or anti-liberal or I'm not telling them I'm political in one way or another saying these are the facts and you can draw your own conclusion on this by by listening to me and seeing what you think and they yeah. kind of laugh their way towards the conclusion and they'll be like no that makes sense i think mm. he's right there yeah what can people do to put more humor into their talks yeah usually well you'll all have mad stories hopefully not about stealing cars from people who maybe deserve their car stolen the, the one i was selling earlier from the guy robbing the pharmacy but there's there's usually lighthearted little stories in our lives we can shoehorn into nearly everything, and I think people forget that that's what the audience allows them to connect with you as opposed to your opinions on things. It's not necessarily the jokes you're saying, it's yeah, the little no. stories. Yeah, jokes have a potential failure rate with nearly every audience, and mm. they also trigger an alarmist response from either you, yourself, because you're like, oh, I'm not sure. It's a joke, and when it's a blatant joke, it's like when you... If you have a boss and they're like, come in, sit down, uh, I have a great story for you. And like your mind's already going like, no, this is going to be bad. Like you've already decided it's going to be good or bad based on their performance in the past with telling similar stories or jokes or their social behavior because they've telegraphed their intentions. Whereas I think a story, you just people naturally start listening to it and you're like, oh, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. just start telling it. Don't you're, tell them. Yeah, you're, you're along it. for the ride. Yeah, I think a yeah. lot of speakers make that mistake where they're like, "Now I'm going to share a story," and the average person is like, "Oh, get me out of here! It's going to be a crap story." But if they just told so the story in a yeah. concise manner, you'd be fine. It just backs up the point. So is any time you can give an example to illustrate your point by way of a story, I think it's a superior way of doing it rather than giving your opinion. It's especially powerful when you get asked to do panels in life. Any speakers who do a lot of panels, panels suck. And everybody thinks panels are great because they don't have to prepare for them. Oh, I'll just turn up and say some great stuff off the top of yeah. my head. But like if you prepare for a panel and you're like, I know I'm going to ask these questions, so I'm going to answer all these questions in a concise story as opposed to answering what I think I feel. And once someone says that, I don't know what it is, but the audience just shits down when the speaker's like, well, you know, I think I feel it's a kind of a thing where, and we're like, this is, <laughs> they're waffling. They're just, oh, I'm going off script. I'm being all creative. Yeah. And you're like, it's going to be bad. Whereas if you have a story where you can just short and concise, boom, here it is, and that's why I feel that way. So you don't have to give your opinion at the start. It's very much like the public speaking. You give them the little story, yes, and it doesn't go on, say, for more than a minute, and then yeah. you wrap it up, and that story illustrates your point, and then you're like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Like people always ask in the world of humor is it doesn't translate because of different cultures and, and different environments and different places you go around the world. And I remember telling them when I moved to China, that I had to get tax receipts all the time when I was working for this educational company. I was setting up a business school in Shanghai. I said, you have to get your receipts or we're not paying your expenses. And I was like, I don't speak any Chinese. How am I going to, no one seems to speak English over here. Where am I going to get my expenses? And the word for I would like in Chinese was wo shang yao. And it sounds like want to shag you. 
So I was like, all right, that's pretty easy. And I was trying to learn this in the taxi as I was literally going to the school. And I was like, I need to try and figure this out by the time I get there. And the word for fapiao or tax receipt in Chinese is fapiao, which sounds a bit like something a bit more dirty in Ireland, which was easy to remember. And the way they pronounce it is fapiao, fapiao. They say it quite <laughs> aggressively. And then the word for if it's not too much trouble was ma fanny. So it was like, I just literally had to say to this taxi driver when he hit on the brakes and he turned around, there was a moment where we just locked eyes. I was like, what a shag, you fuck you, my fanny. And he just like <laughs> laughed and just said, hung hao, xia xia, sai jian, and gave me a tax receipt. And oh, I was like, yeah. I can't believe this stuff actually works. <laughs> but it was madness. But I always remembered how to say that in Chinese because of that moment. And I think you could translate that into any language and most people would have some form of joyous reaction at the end moment of it. And it translates into any language in any culture because you don't have to know. You just have to change the key words to allow someone to understand. But most stories negate a cultural disconnect, whereas sometimes one humor appreciates humor a certain way and sometimes another one doesn't. But we all just love stories in general. And as long as it has the form of a story, you actually did something and you learned something and you welt somewhere. You don't know that there's a joke coming in any way. You just know that the story is going to complete. So that way you can laugh at it or you just say, oh, that was a story. But yeah. there's no moment where you're like, wah, wah. like that yeah. was meant to be a joke and it, it wasn't funny. Another great thing that you taught me that has done wonders for my speaking oh. is putting a story that I know is a great story with a lesson I want to share and that those two things don't necessarily have to go together. Yeah, not at all. So I tell a story about how I prank called someone and tried to sell them penis that. pills. And then at the end of the story, I say, and that's how I met my mentor. And the lesson I learned from him was about marketing and advertising. It doesn't have yeah. anything to do with the penis pill phone call, but the prank call story is funny. Exactly. And, so and, you, and, you, do, and you just like telling it. And that yeah. makes it easy for you to deliver. And you don't need to be up uh, the night before nervously prepping because you're like, oh, I'm just going to talk about what I'd like talking about. That's yeah. fine. So it just all of a sudden your talk that was a scary 15 minutes now is three or four stories that are two or three minutes each. So you chunked it up and then a lesson. And you're like, actually, that's now a really fun 10 or 15 minute talk. And I don't have to prep much for it because one story, lesson, one story, lesson, one story, lesson. Thanks for your time. So easy, and it's so much more captivating than just getting up there and being like lesson, lesson, lesson. Yeah. And people remember the lessons they, when you share the stories. They do. Because our brain is built to remember stories. And, and they come up to you after, and they'll want to talk to you more about whatever that incident was because something similar might have happened to them, or they might have pranked a friend, or something might have happened with their mother, and you mentioned your mother. Like, they're very rarely going to come up and go, you know, lesson number six on that lesson of 15 lessons was amazing. It touched me. It just, it, you feel the need to give it to them because you're like, listen, it took me like 20 years of making mistakes to learn these lessons and I've distilled them to 15 things that you need to do, but their brain just can't remember those 15 things. So yeah, if you get them in a longer workshop, in a longer format, you can talk them through it and you can break it up a bit so they internalize the lessons. But in a short talk, they're not walking away with those 15 things that you've put so much sweat into remembering. So you're much better off just tell any story and just try and find a lesson and be say, I told you that story because after the story, and then everybody's quite happy you told it. But it just yeah. forces you to give a lesson from the story, no matter how disconnected it might seem. So and a good that, takeaway would be to figure out what your one to three best lessons are. Yep. And then figure out your one to three best stories. And oh, just give that. Don't try to give 15 yeah. lessons. And I, I would start with the stories. Just say, what things do I love start with saying? And how do I link these to my okay. topic? Yeah. Because that just forces you to put a bit of you within the talk, number yeah. one, rather than the lesson. Because you, you find the lessons in the things you love talking about, and it just makes the talk a lot easier for you. But your audience nearly always loves it. It works good, and I think most people talk themselves out of that strategy. You're like, oh, no, I can't use that story about my mother. I can't use that story about my dad. Like, there's always something your parents are doing that is kind of bonkers. <laughs> like my, We were just home with my mom, and um, my mom just out of nowhere, she's like, David, gay marriage, what do you think about that? And I was like, oh, here we go. And she's like, nothing new to me. I was the first lesbian to get married in Ireland in 1970. And I was like, does dad know about this? I don't think he does. And he was sitting there, and apparently... He, they couldn't find his birth certificate when they were getting married. And she goes, oh, well, your father had a dead sister called Patricia, luckily. And I was like, luckily, dad? I didn't, never knew there was a dead sister called Patricia. And I was like, this sounds pretty central to me, ma'am. She's like, no, no, not central to the story. Blatantly central to the story. And she's like, it turns out that my dad had a dead sister and her name was Patricia. My dad's name is Patrick. 
and they couldn't find my dad's birth certificate of the morning of the wedding. They were all a bit hung over from the night before and you need the birth certificate. They're married <laughs> in Ireland, so they, fed, they had Patricia's birth certificate, the dead two-year-old girl. So my mom, the priest didn't have the best eyesight and my mom and dad didn't want to cancel the wedding. So my mom is actually technically and legally married to my dad's dead sister, Patricia. And I only found this out a year ago. Oh, wow. But like, imagine you were given some fluff business talk, right? And I'm not saying it's going to, you wouldn't be given a fluff one, but someone out there is giving a very generic business talk and they're like, find lessons out of that. They'd be like, I can't tell that story about me mother but like if you think about that for 10 seconds i don't know the answer to that it just, just popped in the top of my head but like we would be able to extract the business lesson out of that we'd be like you could be something like never assume you know your customer never assume you know anything about your customer because even there's people in this room who don't know everything about their own family so you can never assume you know what your customer wants and their needs we have to fill and that story would be perfect to illustrate that point so, the, so a lot of the time, the magic in public speaking is finding the transition line that makes perfect sense to something that you think is fun to throw in there. Mm. And the lesson is in that. So I, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but it sounds like it might make sense. Or just some variation on that where yeah. you're like, you, you don't know your customer. Anyone here know their family real well? I thought I did until my mother came over and ate a bunch of cannabis cookies in San Francisco. And I was like, you ate cannabis cookies? I didn't think you ever did that. And then it turns out the day, remember I said the Pope came to Ireland in, in 1979 yeah. when I was born? It turns out that was me and mom's first day ever doing mushrooms. And I was like, you did mushrooms? Oh, I wow. didn't know that. And I only found that out like two months ago. So it's like we assume that we know the people closest to us. And we assume sometimes in the same day we, we know our customers. But you generally don't. Yeah. And those family stories, too, are all relatable. If you're talking about your yeah. mom, your dad, your brother and sister, the crazy weird uncle or cousin. It's yeah. like If, if you look at the best stand-up comedy specials, you break them down, they're nearly always some weird interaction of, of family social dynamics because mm. that's the most relatable. And usually in the world of public speaking, relatability trumps most other things. But he has an Irish comedian, I remember listening to him, called Dylan Morn. It's fantastic. And he travels all over the world. And he goes to Russia and does shows. And other comedians like, how do you perform in Russia? Like, how, do you, how do they relate to you in any way? And I remember a very insightful thing he said was that he will do a show, the content he will limit to what he thinks somebody would pay a palm reader to learn about themselves. So if somebody went to a palm reader, what do they want to know? It turns out they nearly always want to know the same things, how well, love, family, fortune, one of those areas. And he's like, that's what I do in my comedy. It's always uh, going to be one of those topics where people are very self-invested. Yeah. Ah. Awesome. He'll hit the wise amount of people. But yeah, I, I, I was thinking that's a very smart way of approaching it, and I think public speaking is the same thing. Relatability always trumps your 15 business lessons. Love it. And so your book is How to Talk Funny. Do you talk funny? Do I don't you know talk if you funny? can have to talk funny. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> of a, a double entendre on me um, talking fairly funny in America all the time. But yeah, the idea of that was just to argue comedians are the world's best speakers. Should be. They're the ones that clock up the most errors. What are they learning the hard way? The business community people just don't seem to make a disconnect. Like anyone in the business community, when you're like, who would you talk to? They'd be like, oh, speaking coach, an executive coach, executive community. Yeah. Okay. They never think comedian, but the comedian is the one that knows much more about performing in the toughest environments and does public speaking more than anyone. So that book was just me talking to people and going, hey, what did you learn the hard way? And what do you think business people can replicate in talks? Love it, love it. So, yeah. And then you also have your company that will analyze somebody's talk and tell them how to spice it up and make it more engaging. Yeah, well, I'm not a great writer. Like, I'm dyslexic, and I even dictated my book at a time when, like, Dragon Dictate was not ready for Irish <laughs> accents. It was just me shouting in a room with a lot of bad words. But a lot of people kept asking me, can you help with my talk? And I, I was no good, really, on the emotional coaching side of it. And a lot of CEOs we worked with didn't have much time. So it kind of worked out either way. They didn't really want to have meetings. They just needed the help. And we didn't really want to talk about any of the emotional support that goes with managing how they feel about the speaking. And we just distilled it to them sending us videos. And we would turn that into a script. And I'd have a bunch of comedy writers that I met through performance stand-up comedy. They were very business savvy or had gone to elite universities, but had just pursued a career in comedy that were great writers. So we just started using those to punch up people's talks. Yeah, and you guys did it for my talk. And it was phenomenal, oh, yeah, man. Thanks. There was some I, good I was, stuff I was that. laughing out loud, crying. There was some good was lines about tacos in I, there. I, I, still use, I still use the Jack in the Box tacos line. So awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show and dropping this knowledge. This yeah. is great. Thanks for having and me. How can people find out about this? Is it uh, on your website? Is it davidnihill.com? Yeah, davidnihill.com. Uh, okay. Yep, great. all there. And... 
shall we share the real spelling of your last name? Oh, yeah, that'd be funny. Because they're going to see the wrong one in the oh, title yeah, of the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. No, we can. We can put it in the links as well. We'll put it in the, the correct link, just yeah, the yeah. wrong thing. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to say that last part again so it's not weird for the audience. Oh, yeah. But, so davidnighill.com, they can find out more about that service, about your books, and about your upcoming shows, too, because you're a fucking hilarious comedian that everyone should well, see live thank you. in their town. I'm, I'm pretty so. good and pretty sneaky about hiding shows, but I need to start publishing them on there because I've been working on some new stuff. But yeah, you can find everything at davidnighill.com. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks for being on the show. Thank buddy. you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to hear a story that's even wilder than that one, click here. You only have five seconds, though. Five, four, three, two, one, go!